I'm Daniel Silverstone, I'm the Head of Criminology and Policing and I'd like to welcome you today for a special event to the Practitioner Forum but most importantly to uh, Wendy's inaugural lecture and she's going to be talking on the method of photo voice which explores the perceptions of offenders. Um, but before she does that I'm just going to say a few words um, about her as a colleague and also about her work. And I think it's uh, fitting today that um, I'm doing so at the Practitioner Forum because it's something that Wendy set up. She's got a kind of Aladdin-like skill to conjure something out of nothing, even in our straightened um, public sector that we work in. And this is, I think, just one example of that. And secondly, those, who, those of you who know her will know she's anything um, but not the uh, ivory tower professor. Uh, Wendy is someone who doesn't look aloof out on people, but her work emerges from the practitioner environment. And a brief look at her CV will tell you that that experience has been a long one. She's been a nurse, a social worker, a policy wonk, and uh, a senior probation officer before she joined the academy. And the voices of practitioners are resonant in her work. And in her last book on uh, probation and social work on trial, I picked out a particular sentence which I thought um, was important. Towards the end of the book, it says she says, one of the weaknesses of the current political climate is the lack of relationship between poor communities and the political elites through which the interests and concerns of ordinary people could be articulated and effectively represented. And I think if it wasn't self-reflective, it ought to be, because that's very much how I see Wendy's work, bridging that gap between the excluded and the elite. And certainly in her articles on mentally disordered offenders, on young people and on practitioners caught in the web, our own web of um, risk assessments and so on. Um, she's always sympathetic, a sympathetic voice, but also a prescient one, uh, someone who looks ahead. She was very quickly onto the privatisation of the criminal justice system way before the sort of catastrophes we've seen this year. And she also noticed in 2007 the alliance, the, the dangerous alliance really between risk assessment preemptive criminalisation and institutional racism and how it affects the black community and that was seven or eight, seven years before the death of Mark Duggan and since then uh, Wendy's been writing uh, prolifically as normal about the riots and again she's taken an interesting position uh, of course not the gang talker of the right but also not perhaps the utopian uh, view of the left that the rioters were simply sort of vapid consumers, but somebody, but focusing really on the disproportionate policing of young people and um, the closure of young people's um, facilities. Uh, so, and the nicest thing really about that is that when you're someone who, whose work is also resonant in her personal life, you know, there's a real overlap. Um, as much as she's sympathetic to uh, the people in her work, in her written work, we find her sympathetic as a colleague, as someone who's loyal and effective and also um, provides great care and uh, pastoral support to the students who um, she tutors. Uh, we think, or well, we know that Wendy can be single-minded, driven, industrious. Um, she's a talented uh, woman, obviously, and someone who doesn't really uh, talk the talk, but someone who walks the walk. And I know that uh, for many students and several of our colleagues, she provides a real inspiration. So, over to you, Wendy. I'll follow that. That's very lovely. Thank you, Dan. Um, and thank everybody for coming and supporting me in celebrating my um, professor role in criminology. It's really good to see everybody here. And thank you to my family who have always been a great support to my friends who have seen me through many, many different guises and different um, parts of my life and to my academic colleagues and also my students. Um, I just thought I'd sum up my journey to how I came to be where I am today. And as Dan rightly said, I did do nursing and social work, but my interest in criminology started when I became a probation officer with uh, some of you in the audience in 1989. 
um, at London Probation. And this fuels my passion for probation research. I took a brief um, trip to Brussels where I worked for three years as the European um, Research and Offices Manager where I studied and researched social policy and development issues. But I missed probation. I missed working with offenders and I missed my colleagues. So I came back and this time I went to work at Hertfordshire which was um, in charge um, of um, so I worked for Hertfordshire Probation and I started um, being a practice teacher um, to help train new um, probation officers. And that's when I started a little bit of lecturing. Um, I started doing a little bit of sessional work for De Montfort University who um, ran the consortium in the east of England. And I so liked that work that I then applied and got a job as a full-time lecturer at University of Hertfordshire and this time I, cha I trained um, probation officers based in London, some of whom might be here today. Um, and then I decided that I wanted to go more into mainstream criminology and I went to Middlesex for a couple of years and worked with colleagues uh, there and then I finally joined in 2010 London <coughs> Metropolitan University and I must say that the support I've had from past and present colleagues here has been great and has enabled me to be standing here today. So my research. I've always been interested and passionate about probation. I think probation has done and does great work. Great important work in trying to help people change their lives and in enabling them to come out from the margins, come back from the margins rather. And so, as Dan rightly said, um, my first work that I did uh, when I did my MA at Middlesex with Professor John Lee and um, Anthony Goodman and Kevin Stenson, who are all here from Middlesex, um, I specialised in looking at the way the criminal justice system tried to label and preemptively criminalise, push people into the criminal justice system just because they behave differently or because they were seen as antisocial um, young people. And I thought this was really important to highlight that professionals and policies often put people in very vulnerable positions and then criminalise them and they get caught up in the criminal justice system. This master's um, programme then led me to think about risk and public protection and the way that probation was training from the time when I joined it in 89, all those years ago, um, to, towards a de-skilling of practitioners and towards a tick box mentality where people um, were encouraged not to look at holistic views of people but to put them into little compartments and to give them a risk score. And I thought this was dangerous. I thought this was de-skilling and I thought this would end in, end in disaster. And sadly, I think in some ways I've been proved right. I looked when I was doing my PhD at Hertfordshire at uh, various aspects of this risk and public protection agenda. I looked at parole reports and child protection um, work, both in social work and probation, and work done with dangerous offenders. And most latterly, my work has looked at privatisation of probation. I've done a number of articles with colleagues John Lee and Davinda Curry on privatisation and the way this is affecting service users. And People think that offenders don't notice. People think that offenders don't recognise that things are changing. And I wanted to prove that people do recognise that and to see how they recognise that. And that led me to what I'm going to talk about today. So photo voice. I love it. I think it's a great initiative and I didn't invent it, but I'm really glad I discovered it. I'm part of a cross-European network um, that's funded by the COST programme, which is the Corporation of Science and Technology Research. But basically it means that we're given European funding to gather together different probation researchers, whether they're from practice, academia or NGOs, to work collaboratively across countries to find out about offender supervision not just from the practitioner point of view, which I've done quite a lot of, but also from the offender point of view, or the service user point of view, how they experience being supervised, 
and what are they concerned with, how their lived experience of supervision manifests. And so we wanted to hear what offenders' experiences were and how they viewed both probation as an agency but also their supervision. And we wanted to make this visible because we felt that it was very invisible probation. If you think of police or prisons, it's very visible. You know what people do. You can have symbols in your lives of what you know, a prison looks like, what a police officer looks like. You ask people what a probation officer looks like or what they do, and there's a blank. So we wanted to try and make the public and the political and community views about the processes and experience and impact of supervision more visible. And hence, we tried to think of a, a, a way of doing that in a visible way. As a group in Europe, we sat down for a, quite a few sessions together to think that there should be more imaginative approaches to research. When you read research articles, it's often semi-structured interviews, my students will remember this, and um, lots of focus groups. But very little is done in a creative way often. And it's important to recognise that sometimes the offenders that we're working with aren't the most articulate or well-educated people. They can be, but they're not always. But they have strengths and they have creativity. And we felt that, that if we could tap into that creativity and use a new visual method of exploration of offenders' experiences, that would um, actually help the participants to feel empowered and enriched, but also engage with the public and engage creatively with policy help, um, makers, hopefully. But not many of us are very confident in drawing. There's a few in the audience that I know are very confident in drawing, but some of us aren't very confident about drawing or painting. And so we thought, well, how can we enable people to be creative and imaginative but get away from that fear, I can't draw, I'm not very good at drawing. So I suggested to the group that we use disposable cameras. And photos are a very good way of trying to gain a deeper understanding of how people feel. And the visual um, uh, images can be a very powerful tool to aid communication. And that is why we um, decided to go ahead with photo voice, which I'll explain in more detail in a minute. But the reason I thought about visual images was I went to a fantastic, um, a fantastic exhibition at the Royal Festival Hall where um, the, I, I saw paintings done by people who had been confined, both confined in prisons, confined in psychiatric institutions and deportation centres. And I took some pictures of those and I'll share those with you now. Now all those pictures were done by people in their art classes in the prison or in their psychiatric wards or um, in the deportation centres. And what you can see is how powerful they are. Without any words, without any explanation, the images themselves speak to you. So I thought that that um, very powerful exhibition experience could inform the Photo Voice project. So then I went to the British Library and started reading about who'd used photographs in social research. And needless to say, I found that other people had, but not in criminology necessarily. I know it's been used more in prison research recently, but it hadn't been used in probation research. It first came out as a method in health promotion and working with mentally ill people and community development back in the 90s. So it's not new, but what we wanted to do was apply it in a new way. And Gillian Rose in 2008 saw that photographs have been very popular with social sciences and researchers. They're easily accessible images. They provide an insight that speech and writing often are unable to. And remember our client group sometimes finds speech and writing very difficult. They capture and record reality in a very immediate way and they encode an enormous amount of data in just one image. And as Howard Becker, the eminent uh, sociologist, uh, recognised, they're the real flesh and blood life experience of 
many people once they've taken. Julian Rose talked about two main methods of photo voice um, or photographic um, um, research methods. And um, one's photo elicitation, which uses photos to, in discussion groups or in interviews to enable people to talk more deeply as a visual prompt, as it were. And the photograph taker becomes a co-researcher, a co-producer, who interprets the material with the researcher. And I like this very much because I think it equalises the power between researcher and the research person. And there's also photo documentation, which you've probably seen in documentaries and other um, research such as that. Um, and that records a specific experience or a specific time. That probably doesn't apply to the project we've undertaken. <clears throat> so I thought when I was reading about this method that the um, strengths of the approach were that participants had an opportunity to reflect on their lives themselves in a new way. It gave them a distance from their ordinary routines. They could take a step back from their experiences and explain how they negotiate a public space or respond to probation supervision or a probation appointment. It enabled the researcher and the people being researched, whether they're individuals or groups, to be researched, um, to enable a, a social relationship to be made very, very quickly and very powerfully. And there was a lot of pride in the photographs that people had taken. It's, as I said before, it's not a verbal or oral or written data, but the um, interviews and the data provided by the focus group supplements and reinforces some of the images and the stories that they uh, bring. But it is a very intensive and very emotionally engaging method, and we found that when we did our work. Many of you know about ethics committees and the difficult issues that you have to go through to get through ethics, and you can imagine how they were difficult when you put offender and photograph together. Instantly people thought, you know, this can be dodgy, there's lots of risks involved. So we had to very clearly think about the vulnerability of the people that were taking the pictures and how those images could actually um, uh, be bounded and setting boundaries so that the images didn't involve anything that could be identifiable in terms of place, in terms of person. But also we had a lot of issues about ownership and authorship and whether people wanted their work to be displayed and whether they would consent to that. So we thought very clearly and carefully about that process. And to aid that process, we used the facility of two artists, one Caroline Cardia and one Jenny Wicks, who was involved in the Scottish um, programme. And we tried to facilitate group, the groups being set up and the project being set up by an artist, and then the focus group discussions were led by the artists. And we found that a very powerful and effective way of working. So what did we do? We went to three countries, well I went to two, and uh, Fergus McNeil and his colleagues did the Scottish end. Um, I went to England and Germany, um, and I uh, worked with Professor Christina Grabschen um, in Germany, and um, I worked with Laura, uh, intern, and Caroline in um, England, and Caroline came to uh, Germany. And we thought it was very important when we were thinking about how to access the um, service users, how to get them on board and how to get staff on board. We thought very clear, carefully, should we access the people through this probation service or would that limit the way that they experience uh, the groups? Or should we go via a charity, whether it's a women's centre or um, ex-offenders support um, centre or advice on alcohol and drug centre. In the end, we did get a better response from people through the charity sector. But I did um, gain access to probation, but sadly, um, no, no probation has turned up. So I don't know how that was communicated from the staff down. We used disposable cameras. A, they're cheap, but also they're easy to use. And we wanted them to have the printed material so that they could experience not just another form of digital camera that is easily to, to delete and take hundreds of thousands of pictures in one second. We wanted them to think very carefully about the images they took 
and um, the process of looking at those images. And also we wanted to work out whether they, we should um, set boundaries, should we say take a picture of something that symbolises your probation office or your journey, or should we be flexible? And we opted for the flexibility because we felt that would enhance the creativity of the project. And um, I think it worked very well. There was a big debate about whether we should have captions and words associated with the um, pictures, and we left it up to the people taking the pictures, whether they wanted to attach a caption or not. And also we were aware that some people might feel quite vulnerable quite vulnerable in a group setting and talking about things that are quite painful, so we offered one-to-one. -one. But interestingly enough, um, all our participants so far have chosen to talk together about their photographs. We're very lucky in that we got support in terms of funding and um, a platform from the Howard League for People in Reform, and their hope is that this will raise awareness about probation, <clears throat> and that we produce some public leaflets that can actually be a visual representation to people about what probation does and how it's experienced. We also want to have a blog where we can have policy and um, practitioners and the public engaged in a debate about this project. And there's going to be some exhibitions. There's going to be an exhibition in Brussels in next March, which is at the end of the European Wide Network. It's our farewell exhibition. But also the Howard League are going to have a travelling exhibition that can be used in libraries and probation services or whatever to publicise the work and the experiences. So what did we do? I managed to access 10 women via a women's centre in England <clears throat> and the women had very diverse experiences of probation. Some of them had had probation in the past, some of them were on probation um, as we um, did the project with them and others have been in, in prison and were released and on some form of parole supervision. And this was the same for all our groups, it's a diversity of supervision which we did want. I'm aware that I had a gender imbalance in my um, group and obviously we know that the majority of offenders are men. <coughs> But luckily in Germany and in Scotland, it was a little bit more representative of the offender population. It wasn't because I didn't try to access men, it was just that the access wasn't forthcoming to the uh, probationers. And Caroline Cardi, who was the artist in England and Germany, um, encouraged playfulness and a creativity and a flexibility in her approach. Jenny Wicks, um, the artist in Scotland, was a little bit more structured in that she set the composition and showed examples and I know that the two artists probably would have a debate about which method is better. But they both worked and all the images were very, very powerful and I'll get onto those in just a second. So we had a preparatory meeting, we gave out the cameras um, in the Women's Centre because of the ongoing relationship they had with the Women's Centre, we could leave it a while and go back. But in the German setting and the Scottish center setting, it was done in much more in workshop format and a compressed day. And so different um, intensity of experience. Um, what I liked about the women's uh, center experience was that they got quite excited about seeing the images and they remembered them differently because they had been that time lag. Whereas in the workshops that were just intensive one day workshops, it was a, diff a different experience, but still effective. And as I said, we followed up by focus groups where we looked at the images with the artist helping the discussion and the images um, and the discussions were transcribed and analysed. We thought it was very important that people that took the images could discard any or focus on the ones that they felt were important and, as I said before, could attach captions if they wanted to. So the themes which Laura and I have analysed through um, lots of... Uh, um, analysis of the data are as such. Um, one very strong theme is about rubbish, how people had this sense that their life was broken, um, messed up, discarded, and that they were broken and damaged and bruised and tarnished. But there was also quite a lot of fear and anger directed towards an uncaring probation service, <coughs> a criminal justice staff that were very judgmental and not really caring, 
and also a public that didn't really understand what they'd been going through. But also there was um, the notion that people understood that there was a dual role done by probation, that they were involved in monitoring, but also there to help and support people. But they did recognise that there was a strong surveillance and control element of probation and the criminal justice system um, generally. Sorry, generally. <coughs> There was a lot of resonance about time, time wasted, time travelling, feeling worn out, battered and tainted, and um, that this was a, a continual problem for the people that were on probation, and the sense that their time wasn't as valuable as the people that were supervising them, that their time was fluid and it didn't really matter, whereas the probation officer's time was very important. And that links into the money and costs it has on people when they offend. The cost in terms of the, 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 the lost money, in, in especially, particularly if they're addicted to alcohol or drugs, but also the cost in time, the cost of experience, the lost, lost lives. And the fact that people make judgments and misrepresentations of the people that are on probation. And that their judgments and self-judgments and reflections can be quite harsh and unfair but also that they have to put on different masks in different situations. There was quite a lot of talk about health and addictions and physical ill health and mental ill health. But there were some optimistic um, pictures, pictures of hope and resilience and moving towards light and change and the ability to, to grow and, and um, experience nature and, and nurture in a new way. So it wasn't all negative, but there were very strong uh, negative messages. So, at last, some pictures. This was a very powerful picture. The lady that took this thought that she was that bag. That everywhere around her was clean and organised and tidy, but that bag represented who she was. Very sad image. But it also a little bit hopeful, because she'd found the Women's Centre had helped her to try and get away from thinking like that. But I just think it's amazing when you look at how tiny that little bag is in relation to the rest of the picture. <coughs> I like this picture, it's quite an optimistic one. It's reflecting about, grateful for your support on the box. Um, it's a charity box. But they said that what, what we need is help and we're all crying out for help. And that box is saying that people will help us. Um, we want people to help us. This one didn't have any words or captions. It was just sent to me, actually, this picture, by one of the women in the Women's Centre. But I think it symbolises, and it's reinforced by some of the German um, pictures, that pervasive nature of supervision, the all-seeing eye, big brothers watching all. And again, the idea that time is, you know, fluid. When you're, when you're a probationer, you, your time is expendable. You know, the probation officer has very strict, structured time, and your time just floats away. You spend it waiting on sofas or waiting for things. You, your life is suspended. Your time is suspended. And they talked a lot about suspension of time and existence while they were on probation. I quite like this image because I think it's interesting she shows southern comfort because this woman was a long term alcoholic and she said that alcohol had been her support, her prop for a lot of her life but she could recognise that it was money down the drain, time down the drain, resources down the drain, life down the drain. And also um, the idea that you put on different masks in different <coughs> situations. This was a very powerful discussion about how it felt like to go into the dock and how women felt when they were being judged and that they felt that they, they were putting on different masks for different <coughs> people, whether it's the probation officer or somebody <coughs> there being judged by the solicitor. And you, you're being someone you're not because if you show the real person you're that rubbish and um, that tainted, battered person. And people don't want to see that. So that was a very powerful <coughs> image. 
I like this one as well because uh, women have made this as a poster for the Women's Centre. It's a sort of collage and a couple of them have taken this. But one of them said, you don't really know a man until you walk around a mile in his shoes. And they were talking about how people judge people on probation. People judge people when they broke the law or become heroin addicts or, or um, alcoholics. But they shouldn't judge them in that way because they do not know the route they've gone and the, the walk they've taken. This was another very powerful image I found. I don't know if you can see there, but there's a crack in that pillar. But when you look from the other angle, they look fine. You can't see the crack. And this woman reflected on the brokenness. And what I mean is, even though it's broken, it's still standing in the same way. It doesn't look any different, but actually you yourself might feel very different. You might feel broken, but actually in the grand scheme of things, you look the same as everybody else. And this lady has had a number of mental health problems, so she felt quite damaged inside. And I thought this was a very powerful juxtaposition of two images. <clears throat> and then hope. It's not all negative, and uh, many of the women that were doing uh, quite um, innovative work in the Thinking Ahead for Women group and other groups that were run by the Women's Centre. And one identified this toolbox as the new skills that she'd learned while she'd been on probation. But we had an interesting conversation about this, this drawer. Was this drawer still a bit empty? And we wondered if that was um, the idea that there were still more skills to be gained. And we talked about that. But she was very positive that she had gained a lot from the support and encouragement. Many images were like this one. They took different forms, whether it was a, a tube train going towards a light, or a, a light bulb, or a star in the sky but they often reflected that they were moving towards the end of the tunnel, that they were aiming forward towards the light, and that they could see that things were going to get better, but they had to work at it. And what's interesting when you look at this image, and those of you more experienced in this than me will, will see this, is that there's a lot of dark there as well. So although there's the light bulb and the hope, there's also a lot of dark there still to get through. And this image is a powerful one. This was a tree that was knocked down in front of the woman's house. It was one of the only trees in the area. And she was very upset that it was knocked down, cut down. Um, and it was cut down because it was diseased. And so um, she felt very sad about that. But then she saw that actually new growth had happened. And that actually sometimes you have to clear away the debris before the new growth can happen. It was just an image of a bit hopeful. <laughs> okay, so we went to Germany. <coughs> we managed to arrange to go and visit some centres in Germany to set up a project there. And as I said, we changed the image. We changed the way we went um, through um, the project there. And we did it in uh, workshops because obviously I was only there for a week. And we also limited the number of photographs that people could take in because of the time constraints. It was a very, very intensive week and uh, some of the groups that we sat through were very, very powerful um, and very comparable results to England and Scotland. And I'll show you these themes that resonated with all the different groups. So there was this still the feeling of hopelessness and depression Again, the strong theme of time. A lot about constraint and limits to freedom and control. And again, rubbish and shit. Um, there was quite an image about trust and mistrust in um, Germany, but that doesn't come out quite so much in the other two countries. But also the idea that nature and growth and regeneration is very strong. And the idea that you're going through a journey that your probation um, experience is part of that journey. Again, the idea that judgment, misrepresentation, stigmatisation, <coughs> alienation is a strong theme. The fact that you've got reduced citizenship and you're infantilised in many cases in Germany. And then, again, the idea of um, looking at health and well-being, addictions and trauma. So some of those German images. 
I thought this was a very powerful one. And this was one of the condensed um, sessions. He went away and took this within about an hour. And he thought that the circle illustrated how, although he's trying to move forward, he's always been in the circle. His time stands still and he can't really get anywhere, he can't progress. And this was somebody who spent a long time in prison and was now out in a halfway house in Germany. And he thought that actually his life was in suspension. He couldn't really move on until he was finished with his probation. But then he wasn't sure whether he'd ever move on. He always felt that he was at point zero and that he couldn't actually move forward. But he didn't want to give up. He had the hope that he might move forward, but he wasn't there yet. This was the image, and I had to get a dog in. This was the image of people behind bars. Um, that even though you're in the community and you're outside, you're still behind bars and you're still restricted. You're never fully free. In fact, you're not even fully a, a citizen. You're infantil infantilized. You're made to feel like a child. And when the guy was discussing this woman, uh, she, he saw that as Lady Justice, making sure that you towed the line and that you were still feeling like a child. I really like this one because this fits very nicely with my previous research about risk assessment <coughs> and pigeonholing people into certain categories. And these drawers, he said he went to his probation office uh, and told them that he hadn't got a job anymore. He'd lost his job and he was really upset about this because he was really enjoying that job and he felt he'd made real progress. And the probation officer was only interested in whether that increased his risk. He said he didn't treat me as a person. All he wanted to do was treat me as a risk category and work out whether um, without work I was going to re-offend. But he didn't actually engage in whether how he felt about losing his job and how he'd invested in the people in the job. And, and he was saying that he saw those drawers and it made him think about how he was slotted into drawers. I like this picture. This was done by one of the women in Germany. And she um, felt that probation laid her naked, as it were, exposed her, but also made her very anonymous. But what's interesting, and she noted it, she's clinging on with those claws. She's not going to let go of who she is. She's not going to... Uh, relinquish who she really is, even though she's laid bare by probation and has to share all her uh, knowledge and experiences with probation, she's going to stay steadfast and move forward. Now this is a very sad story, in my opinion. Um, this is a bus stop, it looks quite an innocent bus stop, but for the guy that talked about this bus stop, it was very, very painful. <coughs> Because once a month he had to go to this bus stop and he waited for his bus, usually just about 15 minutes. And then he had quite a long journey to the office and he hated it. Because when he got to the office, he didn't get greeted by a receptionist like in the probation service um, in England or in other places. He got buzzed in to an empty room where he sat sometimes from 20 minutes to an hour waiting till his expendable time was chosen to fit in with the precious time of the probation officer. I get very angry when I talk about this because it's a very powerful story. And when he went up, he had to be buzzed through to a, a stair that was very steep. And he went up and the probation officer asked him a few questions and then said, right, that's it. And he went down the steps, got let out by buzzers and had to go all the way back in that journey back to the bus stop and he said it felt like a prison and he described it very vividly and very emotionally and you just thought that can't be good doing anybody any good to have that experience and this guy had been in prison for a very long time and he was experienced like that but it wasn't all negative for the same guy he didn't have very much confidence and he said he looked at his feet an awful lot, which is very strange. And we had a lot of pictures of feet, actually. Um, it was like people did look down an awful lot. And whether it was shame or whether it's lack of confidence or embarrassment, there were a lot of pictures of feet. 
But this guy said that although his probation officer was the very guy that he'd gone up the stairs to see and he didn't feel he engaged with, his social worker in the residential unit was fantastic and had really helped him through helping him to find his spiritual um, dimension. He was very into classical music, this guy, and he talked a lot about his love of classical music. And he felt like a real person with his social worker, whereas his probation officer just dismissed him as a risk. Other people in Germany have found probation quite powerful in that it enabled them to think that they had choices. This guy had had a long-term heroin uh, problem and he took the siding or the, the <coughs> railway points where you choose which direction you're going in. And he said he thought probation had enabled him to see he had choices, to see that he could take different directions and uh, make different decisions. And there were stories of hope and aspiration as well. This one is that he thought, I don't know what it actually is, whether it's a light or a CCTV camera, I think it's a light, but he thought it was a spaceship, that he could get on and fly away and start again. But he did feel that he had that ability to start again. He was in suspension, but um, he could start again. And so, so I quite like that image. But others talked much more about their own dreams. This guy had very aspirational dreams. He would like to have a house like that. Who would? Um, uh, so, but he thought that he also could find peace and freedom. Again, another long-term drug user who managed to get out of using drugs. And he said now he had a clearer head. He could actually think about dreams and aspiration. So, I think this is an incredibly <coughs> insightful and powerful um, way of conveying the lived experience of those on probation. I think it's a very effective and visceral means of enlightening the public and hopefully practitioners on the, effective, uh, on the effects of supervision and policy implementation. I think what it does do is um, convey to you the pains of people being on probation. Often when you read the media, everybody says, oh, it's a soft option. It's easy. We didn't get that sense at all. And these were people that have been on probation for short and long periods after prison. So you might have thought that they would find it easy, but they didn't. They found it very exposing, <clears throat> they found that they were laid bare, and that they were made to look at themselves in a very different way. But they also felt that their life was suspended. They were holding on, waiting for the end, <coughs> waiting to start again. Sometimes the probation officer helped them, but sometimes they held them back. And so what we found as a group when we discussed the photos, was that there was a pervasive nature of community supervision, the all-seeing eye, that it's not just about going in for half an hour a week. Actually, those people think about it a lot more of their time. And Fergus wrote a very good blog on the um, recent COST um, conference that took place in Athens, because I did do a talk in Athens recently. And he talked about how probation can just increase the marginalisation and the alienation of the people on it. And that the precariat, the precariously employed, the precariously um, living people can actually feel that that's more highlighted by being on supervision. So this underlined some of my previous research themes. It underlined to me the necessity that we have for skilled professional engagement to affect change and to help people desist from crime and to find the resilience that many of them have if they're given a bit of support and help. And I think, and my work on privatisation um, recently has illustrated to me that I feel that 70% of the probation service has been got, it's gone over to for-profit um, motivation. 70% is now running community rehabilitation companies. And how can those rehabilitation companies hope when they're planning, um, as Sodexo is at the moment, to replace 30% of their officers in five community rehabilitation companies by machines? If you think of that staircase, and at least he saw a human being at the end of the staircase, how much worse if he went to the end of that staircase and had to put his thumb on the screen and answer a couple of touchscreen images? 
How is that going to help him not feel marginalised and precarious within society? So I think it's only possible to really engage people on the margins and bring them back and give them full citizenship if you try and rehabilitate them, if you try and gain um, a rapport with them and help them to gain social capital. And by social capital, I mean a job. I mean relationships with their community. I mean somewhere nice to live. And to build up their lives so that they can be resilient and desist from further offending or drug addiction or whatever they've been involved in in the past. And I think Photo Voice not only can research this, but can aid that process. Because I feel that those focus groups <coughs> enable people to open up in a way that I've not seen as immediately as a probation officer. So I feel that Photo Voice can, could be used not just for research, but for effective engagement, but not by machines. So it's an engaging and energising method. It increasingly communicates um, issues between service users who are co-producers and probation officers. And I think it's a way of making interactions meaningful and insightful and powerful for those people engaged in the research. We're giving back something to the people we research. As researchers, we often take, but this method, I think, gives them something back right from the start. I like the aspirational dimension, that it enables people to tap into their latent creativity and recognise their potential for change and hope. Often people have failed at school or failed in employment, but this can get them re-engaged and to think that they can do something that's creative and powerful. And I think it facilitates empowerment and confidence, and it enhances people's ability to build that social capital, to build those networks, and to desist from offending. And I think this technique is a million miles away from robotic kiosk monitoring and seeing machines as your probation officer. Thank you very much. Drug use, drug problems, 
and we made sure that we tried to work with him and talk to him about his life and actually um, Caroline um, talked to him at the end of the group because we were quite worried about him so, so we actually took him aside and talked to him a bit more because we feel that, that it's a very, very powerful method. You can open a can of worms but as researchers I think we've got a and, and yeah, so I think many of them found it really positive, and I think this guy did. I think he also exposed himself somewhat in, in terms of opening up himself up to his emotions, and I think that's why it was very important that he had time and expertise to do that closing down and closure in a sense before we moved away. I think we all know about the recent incident when um, the CEO of the Howard League was refused uh, entry to private business to expect. How do you think your research can actually affect how, uh, forward going policy and actually break that awful trade that seems to be going on at the moment? How can you say open up the kind of world? How can you do that? Well, I hope that the leaflets and the results of this research will be publicised widely by the health I'm very aware that they refuse um, government money and that they are very, very keen to keep their advocacy independent of well. And uh, Francis Cook, Cook and all the others at the Howard League, I think, do a fantastic job to do that. And I've heard her interviewed many times and she takes people to task. And I think that's really important. And I think it's no... Um, Surprise in the sense that she was very, um, Howard League were very happy to support this because they wanted the pains of supervision to be exposed and the people that are making the policies on whether we replace people by robots or um, whether we make people jump through 50,000 more hoops um, aware of the, the results of that. And I'm hoping that the leaflets we produce for the Howard League will be. Um, past two policy makers and other people in practice to change things hopefully. Can you say a bit more about the role of art in the process? And um, um, you did refer to um, the idea of um, the in the groups that there was a kind of identification between the participants and the other. screen because with the journal group we put them on the screen because we didn't have time to go and print them although by the end of the day they went away with their pictures or whether they were um, hard copies and they laid them out and what was really nice and I know what Carolyn's meaning is that the interaction and the pointing out of things between the co-producers so why it worked so well is that they could see similar themes similar uh, issues and they talked to each other and brought each other out and pointed out things to each other. And, and that was really lovely to see because the, the, the communication wasn't just between the researcher and the you know, um, co-researchers. It was between the different people who take the different images and they saw similarities and really helped each other. And I think they really enjoyed that. So at the end of the groups they all said, what are we doing next? <laughs> And I've never heard when I've done semi structured interviews from the table. And also the um, the idea that the the image became a sort of vehicle for almost a sort of a highly pattern expression. They identified things in the image that they didn't even with people without attention to be able that they that they were totally unaware of. And, and that was just really quite invisible and <laughs> Final question from anyone? At the back. Yeah, if you had a wish on how the research could be used in preparation practice, what would that wish be? Well, I, I think it would be lovely for people to have more time um, 
down with their clients, and the opportunity to um, use more creative techniques. I remember when I was a probation officer, we could use things like the stolt, we used photographs, we used many things in those days. And I think, I'm not saying we should go back in all its entirety, but I do think that ability to build a rapport and to really communicate has been eroded terribly by the workloads, by tick box mentalities, and by government agendas. And I think if I could have a wish, it would be to give probation officers the creativity and the supervision so that they could do that. In, they could use their imaginations to engage in the creative process. Sounds great to me. <laughs> Thank you very much for giving to Wayne.